Before in Asia we had few institutions, now some people might say we have too many. How can these be fit together and does Malaysia have a strategy to participate in all of these and the United States is in some of them but not others? What, what should Malaysia and middle powers do in that situation? As an emerging economy, we integrate and we discuss among our neighbors, particularly in ASEAN, what is best for the region and uh, we uh, thus far as um, engaged with almost all of these uh, international organizations. Uh, but the problem remains, uh, the fundamental issues again, the, the tendency to dictate issues uh, that would benefit certain uh, countries at the expense of others. And WTO is an example. Now, we can say, of course, COP28. Um, you always assume that what is uh, decided by uh, Washington DC and London must be then uh, generally accepted. We say, well, if, uh, if we allow, if you allow us to engage, then let us engage and see the peculiar circumstances and, and time that's needed for these countries um, to emerge successfully. Um, because we cannot follow the dictates and the narrative of certain countries. Uh, I refer to COP28, for example. They will not even honor uh, the serious commitments given earlier, but they expect us to honor. And, and uh, we have to struggle with this fact. Now, Malaysia cannot stand alone, so we'll have to have ASEAN and GCC, some other countries together to at least um, protect uh, our turf. So I'm now combining some of the questions that I've been reading. As you can see, there are only a few. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so one question has to do with China's role in the South China Sea, which you alluded to. And of course, this has created great tensions, concerns in many of the countries, liberal countries of, the, of Southeast Asia, including, of course, Vietnam, Philippines, and so on. Can ASEAN play a role here in trying to dissipate some of this conflict, control some of this conflict that many countries are worried about? China and at the same time the United States would like to have freedom of navigation in the South China Sea. How can Malaysia and more broadly ASEAN play a role in that situation? Well, ASEAN did discuss our position is ideally we should take a multilateral um, regional position in this uh, engagement with China. Um, Malaysia as a country has not faced that problem, although the map uh, was um, announced recently by China do uh, infringe upon our territory or our claim. But thus far, um, with China, we have uh, been rather successful in terms of uh, negotiating uh, with the Chinese. Um, I, I think the problem is more uh, troublesome, more bit contentious with the Philippines and Vietnam. We are engaging with them too, but our position is uh, make sure we remain uh, um, as a regional problem, do not allow for the failures of other uh, countries because that would further aggravate uh, or exacerbate the crisis. Uh, so that's the position as insofar as uh, the South China Sea is concerned. I must uh, again reiterate the point that uh, notwithstanding the pronouncements um, and the claim by various uh, parties, we have not encountered real, uh, I should say, as commissions or problems. Uh, the solution, of course, an aggressive diplomatic engagement. And um, which we are continuing, even within ASEAN, as I said, with the Philippines and Vietnam, but uh, together, ASEAN and China. The APEC, for which you are here, Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation meetings are taking place in San Francisco, and we in San Francisco are in the Bay Area very happy about that. Uh, on the other hand, many people say APEC stands for a poor excuse to chat. This is some Australian pilots who make fun of APEC. So, and there will be a chat tomorrow between President Xi and President Biden. So two questions, maybe the first one is, what do you expect to get out of this, or what do you think will take place from this bilateral discussion between Biden and President Xi? 
and more broadly, what do Malaysia hope to get out of the APEC meetings, given that APEC is not a decision-making body? You see, uh, never underestimate the importance of diplomacy, of engagement, of dialogue, of text. And uh, I therefore do not um, uh, consider that meeting between President Biden and President Xi Jinping something just uh, a normal sort of discourse. It is uh, being looked upon not only by APEC countries, by the world. The engagement and resolution to some of the more um, um, not, not necessarily contested problems of, of uh, Gaza, Palestine, or Ukraine, Russia, but at least three investments and understanding on these related issues would help instill more confidence into the economy, which is uh, required by not only the United States and China, but most of these countries. There's no reason. I say Malaysia, fundamentals are good. Mm. There's, there is uh, uh, progress. You see this um, impressive uh, growth. You have great uh, support in terms of new investments from China, United States, Europe, and others. You see uh, low inflation, under 2%. You see low unemployment, under 4 But still, it's the attack on the currency is severe. Not because the fundamentals were what Fed decides. And therefore, I think, uh, and I believe that this sort of engagement is important. Um, it is a good positive signal outcome of the dialogue or meeting between uh, President Xi Jinping and uh, President Biden. It would create more confidence that despite the differences, say, for example, on the issue of uh, Arab Israeli conflict and Ukraine Russia, there are other issues that they can be resolved, particularly in terms of trade investments. And that would probably give this additional impetus and confidence to investors. So I see in that. What we, we benefit, I mean, just that sort of arrangement of, of, of uh, a more fruitful outcome of the meeting would uh, provide that signal which is needed for these nations. Better improvement in the uh, trade between states and uh, China would mean immense benefit to countries in ASEAN, including Malaysia, because we do export to, uh, it is a trading nation, it's 160% export from, from our you know, initial uh, financial side to, and also to China. So I, I, I um, of course, uh, in, in the detailed meetings, uh, we do consider some of the issues of energy transition, digital transformation, food security, I mean, these issues are discussed, and um, not only to be decided by leaders, but they will be conveyed to the business community, which is very critical. The APEC meeting is not just meeting between uh, our mass political leaders, but more so to involve greatly the private sector. It has more. <laughs> so like many countries who are reliant on oil exports, including the United States, we have to think about the question of continuing to produce and export oil in Malaysia, if I understand correctly from the question, it's about 20% of fiscal revenue. On the other hand, Malaysia has made a commitment, domestic commitment as well as international commitments to improve the environment and cut down on emissions. And you also have the Economy Madani strategy. Could you tell us a little more about that strategy and also how you balance the competing needs of revenue from oil with climate concerns? You know, um, in terms of our uh, decision or policy to protect uh, our both virgin diamonds and forests, we have about 50 percent diamonds and forests. Yeah. No way uh, can be competed by, by most Western countries to not have that sort of capacity. Uh, and the CCUS directly, even 
in terms of oil, gas, we now have this alternative of uh, uh, CCUS carbon capture, quite effective for that. So, and um, our commitment in terms of energy transition remains. Um, and I, I don't believe that this issue of uh, the capacity, the need to continue to produce oil would be at the expense of our commitment in terms of energy transition and renewable energy, which um, has advanced considerably, both in the peninsula part and also in, in uh, Sarawak. And, um, and our commitment uh, among the ASEAN Asian countries, I think, is quite um, clear. Um, there's clarity in terms of policy, and I, I don't foresee serious problems at that because uh, uh, the commitment has been made and uh, we are working towards it and quite clear, and we are subjected to um, international view and uh, study. And we will, of course, honor that, and I think I will announce that clearly in the COP28 uh, remarks. <clears throat> Malaysia is an important uh, technological power. You have semiconductors, you have a lot of high technology equipment. And as you know, every, everybody talks about AI all the time. Many of our students are now very good at writing their papers with AI. We're very concerned with <laughs> the These questions were not written by AI, but they could have been probably written by AI. <laughs> have you thought about what Malaysia, what role Malaysia and other middle powers? can play because the EU has their AI directive, the Americans now have passed some directives on AI. How does Malaysia see itself in that broader game of AI regulation and AI innovation? Why do you ask me this difficult question? <laughs> <laughs> I think the understanding was to give me some degree. <laughs> this is of course a very challenging issue when I mean, we talk about uh, uh, the new uh, technology, new challenge of AI, uh, it's a challenge of values. And, um, and this has been discussed in the region, the sub region of Asia, very active. And, uh, but I must concede that uh, we are not as advanced as we uh, see, for example, in Europe or United States or even China. Um, we just set up uh, now to the end of the year a faculty, in, uh, AI faculty, um, to, to undertake more studies, research, and compare with some of the institutions. I think uh, among the leading, uh, emerging economics, I think the, the most prominent, of course, is CSI Artificial Intelligence University in Abu Dhabi. And um, we are, of course, trying to have uh, more exchanges to learn from that point of experience. But uh, of course, it is a major issue. We require that technology, but we also have to deal with the uh, negative uh, impact of that technology, uh, which do not worry me uh, as much, although I represent the older generation, and most um, of my colleagues seem, seem to be more worried. But I said, it's just uh, the same pattern. When we started with industrial revolution, the that concern too. And then uh, with um, digital technology, with computers, major concern. I remember there was a time when we just started. I had to bring to, and there was massive reaction, uh, negative reaction among many of our uh, villagers because they thought that all these uh, sins and pornography would be there. So I had to bring uh, some of this uh, uh, you get it to the mosque and it's uh, interesting experience because then I said, uh, what verse of the Quran do you want? Number verse, uh, what? Uh, surah 3, verse 14? Okay, then they, da, 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 da. Yeah, they say, oh, this is miraculous. Um, you want to uh, have the Quranic reference to justice? You tell me uh, that immediately. So it's through that sort of child education that they realize that it's not just about. Uh, Sins and pornography. Uh, I think the same issue with AI finally is an issue of um, the individual and the family. 
in terms of values, the character, in terms of uh, their, their, their belief um, when one is right, uh, then basically education which is terribly lacking. Uh, that is also a challenge. I mean, of course, you're familiar with Louis' uh, Excellence Without a Soul, uh, but there's, of course, more social concerns, political concerns. But, but I think uh, dealing with the AI, you need also to extend to the issue of humanity, of compassion, of good values. Um, because that by itself is, is more um, effective than imposing all these rules. Most governments, including mine, um, talk about uh, new laws, new restrictions, which I think would have lots of limitations and uh, would curtail the advancement of this uh, AI. But um, the way out is, of course, to uh, instill that sort of confidence, but sense of uh, values that covers issue human humanity or mean humanitarian ideals, which is not unfamiliar. You talk about Jeffersonian ideals. It's very close to this issue. I mean, Xi Jinping is talking about civilization and understanding and uh, the Indian philosophy or the Islamic philosophy to that. But that's to be lacking. Our reckless exchange is where we differ in terms of uh, the political differences that we have, not to steal uh, Issues of I think, humanity, of humanitarian ideas. Um, you read uh, Tocqueville's um, <laughs> Democracy in America, it talks about habits of the heart. It's, it's uh, quite absent in most democratic societies. <laughs> habits of the heart is the issue of sense uh, and your belief in justice and compassion, in humanity, uh, in truth in what is right. I think this needs to be instilled. And if this can be instilled as a popular move, AI yeah, is not a challenge. Okay, that's good. Well, you mentioned democracy. And in a recent interview with the Council on Foreign Relations, you said you need to work with the dominant party and have compromise and maintain your democracy. Uh, I know it's bad for leaders to give advice to other countries, like the United States. But maybe you could talk a little bit about how you see the need to compromise and what other countries might learn from the Malaysian approach? Uh, not problems. <laughs> <laughs> Who can solve? I mean, what is uh, concerning the that I see here is a firm believer in democracy. We used to see uh, America's beacon, hope of democracy, mm, which unfortunately is not to say not no longer there, but people are getting a bit more cynical because the um, bifurcation and uh, rancor and division is so clear. And the divide and the issue of identity politics, of growing fascism and uh, white supremacy, which we, to me, really tragic as, as a firm believer in democracy and struggle and, you know, survive more than ten and a half years in prison and it's a really serious because, uh, well, is this hopeless? Not necessarily. I think probably this is a period that is most challenging. Hopefully after this battle, and uh, things will evolve and probably, hopefully, the younger generation will insist upon a, a new America based on the <coughs> ideals of this great nation. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, it's not, uh, uh, I should say, trying to advise, I, mean, we, I was a small country and I, I learned and benefited immensely from the scholarship here and exchanges particularly when during the years at uh, Georgetown University but then I would say that this is a difficult period. You see uh, when I was much younger we do look up to America as the, although 
if you had hegemony of imperialism, new imperialism, there, but at least it was a big kind of form of ideas of democratic accountability. Now, nobody else in the United States talk about those things uh, when in reference to the United States. It's really unfortunate. You can see the debates full of rancor and uh, uh, preaching uh, intolerance and hatred of the other. I mean, this is 2023. And you're back on the exchanges, which is far worse than what it was before. And this is, of course, as it was said, as the firm believer in democracy, you have taken uh, United States as a great friend. And this is something, hopefully, but I have great hopes in the future that uh, among the young. And, and uh, the challenge, of course, you know, yeah. And it's the same with Malaysia. I'm not saying that we are completely absorbed from this sort of issue. No. Uh, we have also forms of uh, extremism, religious extremism, chauvinism, which is a real tough battle to, 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 to overcome. I mean, many students here from Malaysia, they're Malays, they're Chinese, ethnic Indians, and from uh, um, different regions, including South Africa, you know how difficult it is. But the appeal, the identity politics, such is so appealing, uh, and and um, our race, our survival. The others are going to Christianize us. The others are going to take over our, our country. In the next twenty years, the Malays are and the uh, Muslims will be wiped out. Simple rhetoric like that, which is um, appealing to some. So it's an error of ignorance. So it's to do what they require lots of courage, struggle, and pain to try and overcome this uh, insanity and madness. So in the United States, we have lots of debates about affirmative action. In uh, Malaysia, you've had a Bumiputra policy for a very long time. How do you think that Bumiputra policy is likely to evolve over the next, say, 10 to 20 years? Well, uh, I've seen this debate about the bell curve, Colonel West and the other, yeah, this debate, fair. You see, affirmative action programs are necessary for the poor, for the marginalized. It need not be necessarily race-based, it must be need-based. But that's where I shift a bit, you see, in terms of our traditional policy. Uh, why do we need to continue? Because um, I think uh, Sandel, this is how the professor we talks about, meritocracy. Yeah. It's not such a meritocracy fair. If you talk about um, competition between uh, uh, Berkeley and Georgetown. But you talk about uh, Berkeley and Georgetown, once you're a remote uh, uh, university or school in Africa, there's no justice. As Rawls alluded to, John Rawls, justice as fairness. It's not just um, fair, uh, just not uh, uh, <laughs> to, to give equality to everyone. Some countries, some schools, even in Malaysia, some schools, urban schools, have the best facilities. You have to compete with some remote school in the heartland, rural heartland. There must be some form of additional assistance. You call it affirmative action, you call it um, additional support. But you cannot have purely meritocracy when there is no fairness. There is no justice in the Sikha. So I think, to my mind, uh, we have to continue with a very serious, effective uh, program to eradicate poverty, to allow for the marginalized and the poor communities to be able to come up and compete. But there have been a lot of wastages. There's so also psychological built up there. Uh, there is the dependency syndrome. Uh, there are issues that we have to discuss, yes. But um, we must allow for a fair competition. We cannot uh, speak purely of meritocracy when we do not provide basic fair opportunities for the 
particularly the poor and the marginalized. The only difference, I repeat, is based on need. We are poor, you are poor. You can be a Malay or Chinese or Indian, you are poor, you are poor. We deal with you as uh, an issue of poverty, not uh, race-based. must be need-based. But a lot of issues I think we discussed in that bell curve, which we have to take into consideration because we cannot allow for the society to be totally dependent, as you call it, um, is uh, dependency syndrome that the Egyptian economist Samir Amin referred to. So we had talked a little bit about democracy and AI, and you mentioned in your own uh, speech disinformation. And I think this is a problem that many countries confront in Europe, uh, in the United States, and also maybe in Malaysia. So is ASEAN able to do something? Are you able to do something to combat disinformation in local languages that could undermine democracy? A lot of these fake videos which have become very popular. How are you thinking about dealing with that problem? Well, you know what? That's why I made reference to the issue of values. Um, there must be at least some uh, basic understanding on what is good, what is right. Um, as as uh, again, uh, in, in reference to habits of the heart, issue of justice or correct, right? But because of the propensity, the incessant propaganda and use of this um, social media, uh, that promotes fake and fear, of course, that's concerning. And how do you regulate them? It's also a major challenge. Uh, there have been discussions within ASEAN. I don't think we can come up with a very formula. If we, we overreact, then it becomes um, too uh, condescending or too... Uh, the, the state then takes it upon uh, itself to, to regulate and they can be also excesses because it depends on the state. If the state is a corrupt state, authoritarian leaders, then you do it at the expense of uh, democracy and freedom. So uh, it is a very challenging uh, enterprise to try and um, not to regulate, but at least to have some sort of a understanding uh, among all parties uh, to limit. Like for example, child pornography, we say nobody agrees, so fair, that's clear. If you do it, then you'll be punished. Uh, but otherwise, uh, where the, the small the line is not clearly drawn, there has to be intensive discussions and debate on what needs to be regulated. I, um, after going through years of uh, imprisonment and uh, under very authoritative rule, have great difficulty in, in, in accepting this uh, government uh, intrusion into these affairs unless it is clearly established and uh, generally accepted by the uh, public. There's a questioner who asks, is there something being done by the government to encourage uh, Malays to come, Malaysians to come back to Malaysia as the Chinese have created various programs and the Indians have done that to some extent as well, especially the non-Bumi population which constitute the majority of Malays abroad, Malaysians abroad. Are you creating some programs to encourage them to come back and start companies and the like as part of your economic strategy? Well, the good news is that some are beginning to come back. You see, this is not just the what perks that they can have. It's the cultural competence. Is the government fair? Is it is just? Is it just? Uh, is willing to accommodate uh, all sectors of the community. But we have given, at least in the new administration, just barely one year now, I've seen so much enthusiasm. I'm meeting some of them here. Um, many um, Malaysians have been quite successful. Um, well, I, I do feel strong with it. Not all need to come back. <laughs> They can serve, and they should send money back. Right? 
end of the year, you can contribute to example, the traditional view that once you graduate, either as PhD or master's, you must come back and serve. Right? I, 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 I propose some change. Let them have the initial exposure. Let them, let, if, if some more uh, come private companies, private enterprise, startups wants to employ them, let them you know, have it. It is um, here, San Francisco is Bay Area, or in New York, you have that exposure. We will we must have a benefit to the country when they come back. Um, or if they decide not to, then we say, please, good. send them more funds to your parents. <laughs> but seriously, uh, we have a team now in the cabinet to do. To, to, um, see what's happening in some other countries and be able to advise people to come back. Um, but then we we'll also be together with the, how, how the economy is being managed. And um, you know, but this is interesting thing which uh, referred to earlier uh, by the, and, and based on the study made by the C Boston Consulting Group. We were doing relatively better in the 1990s. And then uh, you compare to Vietnam, Indonesia, or something like that, and Thailand, they have gone up. We have stagnated somewhat for about 20 years. Um, yes, there's growth, there's development, but I'm talking about uh, sustainable economic development assessment. Uh, growth, uh, investments, uh, health, uh, education. Sustainable economic development assessment proves that we have somewhat stagnated. Now uh, we have to do, we have to undertake real reforms, the tough measures uh, to ensure that they, they have greater confidence in the economy um, can be prepared. Uh, Malaysia is one country in Asia that gives the largest amount of subsidy, uh, it's 81 billion ringgit, 20 billion dollars for subsidy. It's not tenable, it's not sustainable. So, uh, who wants, uh, who dare withdraw subsidy? Your economic state, brilliant idea, but you lose elections. <laughs> so, now we are fortunate, it's a strong government, relatively strong. Now, you can withdraw subsidy, but make sure you are able to compensate for the very poor, uh, give them cash transfers to at least not to uh, put them in a, in a you know, more difficult uh, condition, economic uh, condition. But we can't. Right now, for example, um, we have our decision to withdraw subsidy for debts. We just withdraw for the top 10%. Can you imagine? The top 10% in Malaysia use 50% of the subsidy for the poor. I mean, that's been tolerated for um, decades. Now we have done that. Of course, I can afford to be unpopular to the, to the top 10%, but hopefully the 90% still support me. <laughs> now from then, we talk about other measures. Uh, we spent about, and through that, the savings is 4 billion ringgit a year. Now, uh, we've just imposed this. Um, Withdrawal of uh, subsidy for chicken. Can you imagine? We spent a billion ringgit a year to subsidize chicken. And uh, it benefits everybody, including the richest men in the country, who eat a subsidized chicken. Which is uh, it, it, it a disgrace, really. You should support and subsidize the poor. No. So we have done so. Fortunately, the price has not, uh, I mean, gone up to be able to uh, sustain at the same level. But we say a billion in a year. But these are unpopular measures, tough measures, but it has to be done to save the economy. And we will do it, including uh, petrol and uh, some other measures. But we see, just before elections, we we'll stop. <laughs> so, so we're nearing the end, and I think we've been asking you very simple questions. So I thought I'd ask you some more difficult questions. 
So the, here's the question, what is your favorite Malaysian food since you've been speaking about chickens? <laughs> what is your favorite song by Siti Nurhuliza? In like politics of South Asia, I learned that this artist is very important. The Siti Nurhuliza is of course uh, echo. Uh, and fortunately supporting us, and uh, she did sing a few songs uh, um, for the lectures. At least she sang something, if you have Aziza, the Kasi, Wanita. It's a good song. <laughs> I mean, uh, more uh, the support of women. So the last question, which is very easy for you to answer. There are so many colleges around here, including some inferior ones in the South Bay. You <laughs> have me to ask this question since I went to Stanford, sorry. Why did you pick Berkeley? Oh. I've been to UCLA, Berkeley, Stanford, and some close associates in these universities. But, um, yeah, why Berkeley? <laughs> you want an honest answer or a political answer? This oh, is good. Oh, speak from your heart. Very <laughs> happy. Because of my uh, tendency to speak from the heart, that's why I was in prison. <laughs> 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 you express what you feel and you go into trouble. <laughs> I know, but uh, frankly, I do issue of I consider UC Berkeley is a great university. I had some experience in the past exchanging. Unlike, unlike today, I mean, read the question, but in the exchanges with the students, it's quite uh, vibrant. And, uh, I was quite impressed with that. Uh, but uh, for the second reason, of course, is closer to the Punjab state. <laughs> Very honest. <laughs> I think it's time to give the Prime Minister a hand for an Thank you, everyone. We'd like to request everyone to 